Hello everyone and welcome to this very special Blackwells event. My name's Alice, I'm the events manager at Blackwells and I'm delighted to be here this evening um, to celebrate the publication of Show Us Who You Are by Elle McNichol. Um, so I've just got a few things to go through before uh, we get started. Please bear in mind that we can't see or hear you. So if you're having any technical issues, um, you can send an email to virtual events at blackwells.co.uk, um, which should be the reply email that you've got on your communications from Zoom and Eventbrite. And we'll do our very best to sort that out for you. Um, we have seen on Twitter that some people haven't uh, received their links properly. It seems like quite a few people haven't received their links properly. Um, if you're here and can hear me, this presumably hasn't happened to you, but if um, there's anyone you know who's having trouble uh, getting into the meeting or finding their link, we have resent the link multiple times. Um, and we will put out a tweet saying how you can contact us so that we can specifically try and help you. Um, but please, uh, we are doing all that we can. We're not sure what's happened. I think it might be something on uh, the, the Zoom end sending the invites out, but we are trying to work out what's going on there. Um, Al and Jen will be answering some of your questions towards the end of the event. So if you've got anything you would like to ask, you can put those questions in the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of the screen. If you're on a laptop, and I think it's on the left, if you're on an iPad or tablet, and we'll get to some of those towards the end of the evening. And um, if you'd like to tweet about the event, um, you can use the hashtag Blackwell show us who you are. And I will pop all of our handles in, um, in the chat in just a second so that you can uh, tag us all if you would like to. Now, we are here this evening to um, celebrate, as I mentioned, our second book, Show Us Who You Are. But here at Blackwell's, we're huge fans of, of Elle and have been for a while and um, particularly really um, loved her, her first book as well, A Kind of Spark. Um, and it was, uh, it won our Blackwell's Book of the Year uh, 2020. And we are going to take this opportunity um, to present her with her Blackwell's Book of the Year award. So um, without any further ado, I will introduce uh, Elle McNichol. Elle McNichol is a Scottish and neurodivergent author living in London. She graduated with a first in creative writing and after completing a master's in a master's dissertation on the lack of own voices representation for neurodivergent children, she grew tired of the lack of inclusivity in the industry and wrote a book herself. Her first children's novel, A Kind of Spark, was published in June 2020 by award winning indie press Nights Of and stars two openly autistic young women. A Kind of Spark has been a Blackwell's Children's Book of the Month and a Times and Sunday Times Children's Book of the Week. It recently won a Blue Peter Book Award and was crowned Blackwell's Book of the Year 2020. And I'm really pleased to invite my colleague Miriam on now um, to present Elle with her award. Hi everyone. So my name is Miriam and I was part of the Blackwell's Book of the Year uh, jury. Uh, which meant that I got to read four extraordinary books uh, as part of a day at the office, really. Um, and when I first read uh, the children's fiction winner of the category, uh, A Kind Spark, I was really amazed at how incredibly deep, deeply fulfilling um, uh, Elle's writing was because it just didn't just go about um, uh, here's a kid and some here's an adventure bim bam boom end of page uh, but you got to know her entire family and you got to see inside her head and because she's neurodivergent um, it was really interesting to just live an entirely different life uh, as Addie for a little while so I've I really enjoyed reading A Kind Spark, which uh, of course then went on to win the overall book of the year uh, for 2020. And so um, we're super thrilled that through the magic that is Zoom, we can now hand Elle her reward. Uh, so Elle, if you'd like to come on uh, with your camera and uh, audio. Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> I understand you have an amazing outfit. Uh, well, I can't really see, ceremony. but there's a lot of tool. You can maybe see a little bit of, <laughs> of tool. <laughs> oh, it looks so good. 
<laughs> so uh, thanks so much for accepting this award, which is definitely not a bowling trophy uh, that I <laughs> once found somewhere. But again, for the magic of Zoom, congratulations on winning Black Horse Book of the Year. We're thrilled to have you as a winner. So here you go. Well, I have a beautiful glass one, which <laughs> I love so much. Thank Ooh. you so much, Blackwells. Thank you, Miriam. Great. Thank you both. Through the magic of Zoom, you've been officially you. awarded. Um, all of the award ceremonies have been a bit strange this year, but uh, I think uh, that bowling trophy turning magically into a glass um, a glass trophy may be the most bizarre uh, award show moment I've seen yet. Um, so yes, now moving on to um, El Yoma's recent book, um, Show Us Who You Are. I'm really delighted to introduce uh, our chair for this evening, Jen Campbell. Jen Campbell is a best-selling author and award-winning poet. Her latest books include The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night and The Girl Aquarium. You can also find her online reviewing books and talking about the history of fairy tales and the representation of disfigurement at www.jen-campbell.co.uk and I'll pop a link to that in the chat as well in case you're interested in catching up on Jen's work. Jen, um, welcome. Hi, <laughs> hello. <laughs> It's really unfortunate that I'm chairing this event, Elle, because I'm actually not speaking to you right now. Just so you know, we're not speaking. We're not speaking. You. Oh, I know. Oh, because it's sure. me. So I'm not sure how this event can really happen, but I will try and get over it. I always, <laughs> I always like to read. If we're doing events, I like to read books just before so that I'm they're really fresh. But then the problem with that also is that. I feel like the book has hit me in the face and I haven't <laughs> quite covered yet. It's so good. It's so good. Um, anyway, I'll gush a bit more in a little bit, but um, you can't tell, but I've put perfume on for this event as well, which you oh. can't. There you can see, there's just something about it, right? Because we can't do this in person. We need to do the things that we would be doing if we were going to do this in person. Um, so my first question is, I mean, how are you? How are you feeling? Your book came out last week on World Book Day, and on World Book Day, you won the Blue Peter Award as well. I'm that's a lot. Oh, Tell yeah. us about that. <laughs> it was a lot because we were so. I mean, Blue Peter was it was like ninety seconds long, wasn't it? It was like, blinking, you'll miss me. But it took the whole day to get. To, to lead up to this moment and um so I was getting lots of messages about like happy book birthday to show us who you are and I was like I can't deal with show right now I'm dealing with my my eldest which is much more um of an overachiever at the moment so um it was it was a lot and yeah there's and then there's world book day stuff so there's people saying can you tell our classroom happy world book day and you're like uh not really but <laughs> it's, there's just so much going on um and you know being being neurodivergent that's there's all you know you already have a lot of stuff going on all the time anyway so it was incredible and um and surreal it was like a fever dream and I was holding the badge and was just like this this isn't which I should have put on tonight but it doesn't really go with the two well well it goes with everything really but um it was surreal and and I talked about this a little bit I think on the day but that moment standing before those like strange like cardboard double doors that were going to open uh, for this red carpet moment that was a moment where I'm like I'm standing there and there's a smoke machine and there's light there's so much stuff going on that's quite like sensory it's quite a lot and um the the producing the like runner is like next to me in a headset and a mask and is like you know 30 seconds then you go out and I think everything that everyone said about Spark kind of well not about Spark actually but about autistic kids in books kind of hit me head on and I was like they said it wouldn't sell they said no one cares. They said no one would buy it. They said booksellers wouldn't like it. They said they said all these things, and then the doors kind of opened, and I was like, "Them, <laughs> this is a kid." <laughs> this is a kid but like, I just that's that's what it felt like. It was like, right, that's done. Like I don't have to listen to that anymore. Like this this isn't this is the new chapter now where kids voted for this to win kids yeah. vote for this not some very clever literary people which is lovely as well 
but children they voted for this up against two other books which are both really good and I really liked so that was huge what a long answer but it, hopefully it gave everyone time to yeah. It deserves a long answer because as you said it's a lot and um, when did you film that was it a couple of weeks it was the day of it was live it was, of, it was li- oh my goodness that is so that is so much because it's a huge event and not only that would be a lot anyway for anyone and as you said because you're neurodivergent too but also because we're not used to being around people at the moment exactly. and I was <laughs> it was my first time seeing strangers in a year you know because it was March so it's been a year and I just didn't know how to I mean again I'm not the best at making small talk anyway but this after a year of not doing it I was like I don't know how to do this anymore luckily they don't really want to talk to you they just want to move you to your marks which is fine um but yeah it was it was it was really intense and um can I just say like not related can I just say for people watching like this is really hard for me to be talking to Jen because I Jen is a heroine of mine like I have been watching <laughs> yeah that's fine since like 2016 like this is this is surreal as well this as as much as Blue Peter is I feel like I'm in one of Jen's videos and it's very exciting but also quite scary um but yeah <laughs> it was like, fan girl over each other that's fine that's completely allowed oh, right I've said right but, <laughs> but did, yeah. I, feel, I felt like that Blue Peter moment for you, not to just imprint my impression <laughs> of it on you, but it felt like the end of, well, I guess we're not going to talk spoilers today, but the end of both books where your characters get to say the things that they want to say. And that's what I love about your book so much is that they get to have these amazing speeches and there's so much sass in there, especially in the that's show. Like yeah. Sass, we're going to talk about that because <laughs> sass please me, please me no end. But as you said, it's been a year, right? It's been a year we've been inside and you've brought two books out during that time. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what that publishing process has been like for you. I know it's probably a question that's asked a lot, you know, what is it like bringing out a book in the uh, time that we are living in? But I think it's worth discussing. It is. Yeah. Because... Well, actually, at first I was a little bit kind of bitter and I was a little bit like, woe is me, I'm really hard done by. But I've watched, the, the second time around, I've watched a couple of other authors bring their books out um, in sort of January, February, and they, they'd they either had books pushed back during the summer because of the first lot, or they had never had a book out in lockdown. And they've taken it really hard. And they're all authors who've had books out in the past. And they took it so hard that I thought, wow, it must be, harder in a way to go from knowing what to expect knowing what the done thing is at least you know for you as an author and your publisher what you what your expectations are to then do it you know I don't know any different this is all I know I don't I don't know what it's like to meet a reader I don't know what it's like to like be in a bookshop and sign up like I you know that's so you know you can't miss what you don't have and I think there's so so much of publishing and being an author especially is is comparing yourself to other people and going now why did they get that and I don't get but but I already when I you know signed the contract I was like it's a teeny tiny press and they're a fabulous press but they're you know they're teeny tiny so we were never going to be in supermarkets we were never going to be on a big tour we're never going to be doing anything big or you know major I knew that so I the only expe- expectation I had was hopefully we'll get in a few bookshops and I'll go into a few schools and of course neither of those have been possible um so yeah you have moments where you're like oh and because the industry is so fickle you're like people will forget about me in six months and I'll never have been able to do these things um but then spark kind of snowballed and became this word of mouth thing that did quite well and and people did buy it um he yeah, said quite well <laughs> it did <laughs> very well <laughs> but you know like it, it you know it wasn't you know a complete disaster so <laughs> I think and um and hopefully show won't be either in touch with but uh yeah so I don't compare I don't go you know I don't think oh well I miss you know all those things that I used to do because I never did them so I try not to get bitter because nobody likes a bitter person they're in- they're incredibly boring so I try not to be that bitter person and just hope that for book three we get to see people but fingers crossed mm. and maybe we can even see each other that would be great oh, that would be lovely fingers crossed mm-hmm. um people often say 
the second novel is harder. Did you find that with the writing of it? Was, was it much harder? How was that process different to writing the first one for you? I do think it's harder because you have less time. Um, your That first novel you have Although I didn't have a lot of time with Spark because it was two thirds written and I went to the publishers to ask for a job and they said, we don't have any jobs, but if you have a book and I had to run home and write the ending in two days. So the first one was, you know, it was a little bit stressful, but the second one was very hard and it was hard because it was in lockdown. You know, it's my lockdown book. That's what I like to call it because I just look at it and remember being locked in a room and I was I was locked in a room. I wasn't allowed out um, for three months writing it. And I think that's why it has so many influences about digital people and about what's authentic and what isn't and what's perfect and what isn't perfect. And I had COVID, which was hard um, and quite lonely. And and it was, I mean, nobody cares about this, but this, it was early on in, in the pandemic and I felt very um, ashamed. I, it felt very like a shameful thing to have COVID and you didn't want to tell anybody. Um, and thank God I, I got it from someone in my house and we just stayed in the house and didn't see anybody for three months so um but you know it was it, it was that sitting still and not being able to go anywhere that made me write because I just wanted to do anything except think about what was happening and watch the news and and it was really hard and I never thought the publishers would pick this one I had other synopsis for them but they wanted this one and I was like all right brace yourself because it's it's gonna have a lot in it um but having said that, having said that to people watching, it's very hopeful and positive. It's not this. It's nothing to do with pandemics. It's nothing like that. It's just um, a lot about kind of loneliness and, and making connection. And I think that came from. I never answer questions because quickly. Yeah, it was difficult writing a second book. It was <laughs> what was the nugget? What was the the seed for it? Which bit? Um, I think I'd always had an idea that I wanted to write excuse me, a science fiction about a corporation that were monetizing something really emotional. So I didn't know what, I knew that was something I always wanted to do. For years back, I, that idea was around, I was like, are they monetizing time travel? Are they letting people travel to a certain point in their life to talk to their former selves for a moment? Like, what is it? Like something that a corporation, something brilliant that could be incredible and could be heartwarming and wonderful a corporation has come in and gone we're going to monetize this and take all of the humanity out of it um I knew I wanted to do something like that and then in lockdown not feeling very well a, a dear friend passed away and I thought what if you could um you know and then they passed away from coronavirus so it, was, it was very quick and very you know sudden and I just thought what if you could have that last 10 minutes again with someone and it's them their digital kind of footprint is there um what you know people would spend I know in that moment I would have spent all money I didn't even have to do that and it's it's a horrible way to make money but it is one that I think would make a lot of money and um and then it was about friendship the whole book is a, a love letter to kind of friendship and I think that was the nugget was um was a bit of loneliness a bit of grief and also how much do we need our friends now more than ever does that make sense yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And that, that line, which I'm terrified I'm going to misquote now, where you say, grief is just love wanting more time or asking yeah. for more time. I mean, that line, I was just like, oh, oh I'm gone. <laughs> I was just like, oh, oh. Dear, I'm gone. No, but you're right. That's exactly, that's exactly what it is like. Um, so for anybody who has not read the book yet, as I've said, we're not going to get into spoilers. But yeah, it is about Cora who meets um, a boy called Aiden at her brother's work's Christmas party. Yeah, um, and party. they become friends and she's very interested in what pomegranate is doing. And, and as Elle said, they are trying to monetize people's emotional needs really and, and manipulate them, which is which is horrific. It's kind of, it's, it definitely has black mirror vibes to it in the best way. I just, it's, it's just absolutely, um, it's wonderful. Can we talk about the imagery in it? Um, because I think uh, in a sh short story that I wrote called Animals, there was a, a girl in it who, or a woman in it who's in a, a coma and I was researching names. I was like, okay, what do I want her to be called? And I was like, right, Persephone. And I was like, oh, Cora is another name for Persephone. So when I saw that she was called Cora, I was like, oh, yes, okay, we're getting Persephone stuff in here. I really loved all of that imagery. Aiden even has a dog called Serby, doesn't he? Yeah. Cerberus. I was like, oh yes, Elle. <laughs> I love it. Nobody's said this yet. Thank you. Oh, 
Oh. <laughs> it's called the Pomegranate Institute, and I was yeah. hoping people would, yeah. But absolutely, yeah. Um, I tried for a couple of drafts to get Core to be spelled with a K, so it would reference Core, which is obviously an alternative name for Persephone. Um, editor was like, no, 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 C, C with a C. So, um, but that's fine because I think you know, clever people still get it. Um, <laughs> yes, Adrian is sort of a play on um. Adenaeus, which is again it's not Hades and Persephone's retelling in any way but it is about you know the underworld imagery and pom- is, is pomegranate a modern underworld where they have access to all these souls who are you know inside of there and um I think there's a little bit of Orpheus as well when she's trying to like leave and she's like can't look back um but yeah there's there's images in there and there's images of um fruit and veg in the first half of the book Cora eats a lot of fruit she is you know when she and Adrian are arguing in one scene or not arguing but they're disagreeing about pomegranate she's eating fruit and he's eating salad yeah there's a lot of deliberate imagery in the book yeah and is there a nods to the secret garden or is that just me not deliberately but I do I, th- I do probably think it was maybe a little bit influenced by that um I just love gardens um and I guess I love- especially at the moment they're outside space and the breathing and yeah exactly and um Edinburgh and London and many other places as well I'm sure but I grew up in Edinburgh and I live in London and there are lots of secret gardens here there's gardens that only the rich people can get into and um, Adrian's family are very well off and they live in Knightsbridge so they have one of these sort of communal gardens that that's hidden from from you know plebs like me and we can't get into them and um, so it's 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 very much I love gardens. It's a kind of metaphor for access and for wealth. And, you know, Cora being a bit nervous in the beginning when she goes into the garden, she doesn't feel that she really belongs in there. And then by the end, she's like, oh, spoiler, but like, OK, not really a spoiler. You know, we all know characters grow, but <laughs> but things change in relationship with the garden. And um, yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah. So I definitely saw the Secret Garden influence maybe a little bit more after I'd written it I have my issues with Secret Garden I do like it but I don't love the disability rep that's why I thought it was in there because I thought oh I love it because in the Secret Garden it, it's yes it's Garden about- cures them and um yeah Unless you try hard enough you can just walk <laughs> yeah. uh, cure disability so and this book is very not that bad so, yeah. so, okay, so we're reworking this and, and I love that that sounds um, clever I'll say yeah that that's that, what I was doing just say yes yes yeah. absolutely yes um but I love all that imagery of keys and as you said access so she, uh Cora is given a key so that she can get into Adrian's family's garden and then she's given a pass when she gets to pomegranate as well so she's accessing all of these different levels um but the question is whether or not she wants to be in any of those spaces mm. and so which spaces she happens to be welcome in as well which leads us on to the sass <laughs> we talk about the sass um I would love to know I'm gonna I'm gonna quote yourself at you I hope that you don't mind that without spoilers um <laughs> two particular I mean the, I loved all of it but there were two particular bits that um that I love let's see one three three okay this isn't actually sass. This bit isn't sass because I think the one of the bits of sass would be a spoiler, so I'm, I'm not going to include that. But these were the key things that that I have underlined. So there's one bit um, where I think it's Adrian who's saying this. Yes, he says, Cora, the reason they always tell me, oh, your ADHD doesn't define you is because it makes them feel better about it. Because the minute you find out what makes you different, the minute you love it and accept it and say you wouldn't change who you are, that's when you become dangerous and then likewise on page 277 I'm not going to give the context for this quote (laughs) but she said she didn't count on there being people like Adrian and me in the audience people never do I am not alone and I love both of those things which obviously interlink and you're so right the assumption that people non-disabled people non-neurodivergent people feel if they feel safe in a space and that no one like us is lurking around they <laughs> say whatever they like and they think that we're not there mm. and um and that yes there is a lot of discussion well not a lot but some discussion on person first language disability first language you know when uh, the doctor tells Cora you know you're not an autistic person Cora you're a Cora you're, you're a person with has autism um <laughs> 
<laughs> let's pause on this for a, for a second the amount of power that you manage to put into these um into these pages and these speeches is wonderful and I, what I particularly admire is where you draw the line because when the doctor says that to her she doesn't come back to them and say look I'm going to educate you and tell you why that's not wrong um and you almost want that a little bit as a as a reader you want her to have her moment to to say these things which she gets later but I appreciated that you gave the characters the space to just remain silent and trust that the reader would yeah. know that person is wrong did you find it difficult to work out like how much to put in with regard oh, to yeah. And in regards to that first quote, thank you so much for quoting my work. That's incredible. But um, the first quote, which is, you know, once they like to say it, it doesn't define you because it makes them more comfortable. I found so many reviews of Spark that I got tagged and people were like, we love Addie because she doesn't let her autism define her. And I was like, did you read the book? Hmm. So I think if you read the book, you would understand, like, I sometimes it baffles me and I'm like, what's not coming across? And um, even this morning, we got a, a review in The Independent, which was a nice review of show. But the opening line said, uh, Cora, who has autism? And I was like, you didn't read the book because most not every autistic person, but most autistic people prefer autistic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a little handbag that you can. It's not an accessory. We're not with it. We have it. It's your brain. Your brain is an organ that affects everything you do it affects when you blink it affects when you move your finger you cannot separate um yourself from being autistic if an autistic person wants to say I have autism that is 100% their right and the book is about choice as well which again can't spoil it but we go into that later um 100% by choice but it is something that a lot of autistic people hear is we get people telling us oh no 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 don't say that about yourself don't say that horrible thing about yourself you're not autistic you just have it and you're like it's not a horrible thing you're making it horrible you're projecting that I don't feel that way and um it's really I don't ever want the books to be a soapbox um my characters like you said they do get their kind of monologue moments at the end but um but it's I I don't want to write a textbook and yeah I think I give Cora she's silent in those moments because I do trust the reader especially in book two I'm like if they've come with me to book two I think they're probably pretty good um and also just because if you're, I, I do write for my neurodivergent readers. And what's been so interesting about show is that Spark was, I think, very digestible for a lot of people, which is great. It was very accessible and universal. Show is very much for a neurodivergent audience, primarily. They're my priority when I wrote it. I hope everyone loves it, but it really is for them. And I felt a little bit with some neurotypical readers, they're a bit like, oh, this one's not as comfy as Spark. Like, I don't feel quite as comfy. And the neurodivergent readers have been even more enthusiastic and gone, yes, this is so great. And that's, I'm okay with that. I, there's no <laughs> hate or prejudice in the book. There's, there really isn't, but I am centering neurodivergent people. And Cora is talking to neurodivergent people. She isn't talking to people like Dr. Connolly. She isn't talking to people who want to use it as a textbook or to tick a box. She's talking to the neurodivergent reader, to the neurodivergent ally and to disabled people as a group, I would say, even though every disability is so different. She, I, I didn't want to do little asides where I was like, this is actually, blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, I'm just gonna accept that they probably already know because that's the people I'm writing for. Does that make any sense? Um, it does make sense and I it, it, and and I, I admire that so much because that's something that I struggle with too and also I think it's not just maybe not so much in writing but in inter- well, interviews but also like you know when you're like how much am I here to talk about this how much am I here to advocate how, like, right. trying to am I a teacher this? am I here to yes. yeah and yeah. especially teaching or advocating while you're still processing yourself is 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 difficult as well um like, like from my point of view as someone who makes videos online and has done for six years it's very strange for me to you know, if someone could they, they could think oh that's Jen today and that's what she thinks now and I think always um like you battle with internalized ableism which society has put into you because you've heard so many times oh no don't don't associate that bit as a core part of you it's something that because it's something they would like to remove or see past so I used to 
say, you know, oh, no, I'm not disabled. I have a disfigurement. And, and it was because I thought that word was not for me because mm. that's what I had been led to believe. And so we're always, always evolving and always, always yeah. changing. And that's that strange when you're um, online, existing online, mm. but also when you're writing books as well and you're growing along, along with them. Um, I wanted to ask you what your favorite part of the writing process has been. Is it the initial bit? Is it the later bit? Which bit is it? I think I love starting a book. It's like starting like a relationship. You're like, this is great. We get on so well. We're really compatible. And then 15,000 words in, I'm like, why did I start this? This is horrendous. Um, so I love starting. I love ed- I love doing the first round of edits because I have a really great editor, Isha, who from Night Solve is a really, a really sensitive, clever um editor who is who's not who's not neurodivergent but who is so um just educated on on everything like just really switched on and just sensitive and and really treats me like an equal um and I say this because I've had a co- you know I've had a copy editing experience with a different um publisher and that that was a shock because I'd had Isha I was like oh oh now I'm having to explain things in the bo- in the comment box okay um but that was not with KO um but Isha is just so great so I, I always look forward to getting her edits back and um and, and and starting from there again so that's a really great time for me um and she had a brilliant structural edit for show there was a a plot point that turned out differently and Isha was the one that was like let's let's change this plot point and I think it was the right decision um so yeah she's I love working with an editor I think that that is a fun bit I've seen this amazing graph which I now can't remember the name of but I'm sure if you googled you could find it but it's a a graph of projects in general but I think it specifically relates to creativity and it goes like this so at the beginning when you're really excited because you have all the possibilities in the world you think you definitely do this and then you start and then you start to uncover how much you don't know and 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 it goes all the way down and then there's a bit that you have to break through where you can be like okay right yes I don't know all the answers right now but I need to keep writing and know that I will figure them out later and then you come out the other side and you can look back again. Yeah. I often find myself getting stuck in that bit in project. Yeah. And I never remember that I've done it before. I never remember. I've come through it before. I'm like, this is this is worse than all the times before. And it's not. So, yeah. <laughs> it's not. Like, I, well, I remember talking to an, a, a writer friend of mine and she said she wonders if it's like giving birth, you know, they say it's so yeah. horrific to forget about it so that you'll have more children. She's like, that's what it's like you forget how bad it is so that you write more (laughs) that's brilliant I love that that. Um, can we talk about villains as well villains, um because I love the layering of your villains because you have obviously the the bad bad guys the bad guys but also you have just the everyday bit crap irritants yes the irritants the microaggressions the the everything um and in both books um you have teachers who really don't understand what they're doing and handle situations really poorly and I love that and recognize that so much because I often feel um in books about um disability uh, and neurodivergence in particular authors if they don't have personal experience of that assume that it's children who are the ones who pick on you at school or whatever like yeah. children sometimes yes aren't great but if for me personally and I'm not asking you to discuss your childhood if you don't want to we can just talk about the books but for me personally it was the teachers they were the ones who maybe it resonated more because you expect them to do better you expect them they're supposed to protect you they're supposed to know better so when they don't it has even more weight and um, so was that something that was important to you when writing these I don't have an anti-teacher agenda I promise to any teachers watching like I feel like some people think I do because I got tagged in something last night where it was teachers discussing with a couple of authors discussing just kids books I think and I I got tagged in it so I watched it and it's because they kind of alluded to Spark and, and, and said you know teachers and kids books are always so horrible and it's not fair and it's not a 
fair representation and I, and I kind of I wish I could have been involved in the chat because I would have said you know uh, uh, for kids teachers are like the wardens they're like prisoners in a jail and the teacher it doesn't matter how lovely you are and most teachers are lovely you are the authority and they that's you know in their life and if you have parents and teachers that's the thing bless their heart they're like um you know why can't books have lovely parents and lovely teachers and I said because nothing would happen nothing would happen because the kid would be so supported nothing would happen um and then um and but then one person on the panel went on and said I you know teach in a, in a special school a term I don't like but whatever and and then said you know and the kids are really funny they, they they always say and do things that make me laugh and I went now this is the thing people who think that they are lovely and inclusive and wonderful to a disabled person you may not be we all have our stories and for me a lot of the worst ones are people who think they're being very kind um, Miss Murphy in The Kind of Spark does not think she's being kind and she's not trying to be. She's a, an exaggeration, but there, there is an uncomfortable reality for a lot of disabled people and a lot of disabled kids now because they write to me and tell me where they are othered in the classroom or they are othered in a social um, setting uh, by the adults in their life, not just by bullies. I mean, a, a kid bully will wear their colours on their sleeve and, you know, it is what it is. But for me, growing up, my biggest kind of obstacles were always adults who thought they were being very well-meaning, who'd say, oh, I'll pray for you, pray that you'll get better. I don't need to get better. Um, so I, my, my next book has a lovely teacher in it because I do feel bad for all the wonderful teachers who've been. <laughs> but I, look, if you think, you know, if you think everything's wonderful, that's great, but a lot of disabled people might disagree with you. And um, going back to what you said before, people do always assume we're not in the room. And if we are in the room, they assume that they are very educated and they know everything. And you don't know what you don't know. And if you're not disabled, I'm still learning how to unlearn a ton of toxic stuff. I'm 28 years into this. You've not thought about this until you woke up this morning. I don't think we are going to have the same level of expertise. And mm -hmm. um, so I love teachers and they are so important, but their importance is why they make re really good villains because they, they are the, they're the warden. And um, if the, you're writing a prison drama and the warden is lovely and is like, let's have a chat, let's, let's have a mental health chat. It's not gonna be a very good prison drama <laughs> because they <laughs> won't want to tunnel out. So, you know, I, they, some people are villains because they, um, their authorities and and I do try and write families in books that are very supportive and inclusive because a lot of books about disabled families act as if the disabled child is a bomb that has landed on the house and destroyed everything which is horribly insensitive and not fun to read and also not true so I always try and have families that are united and that love each other and you know they're not you know little house they're not you know lovey dovey but they're very supportive of each other so because my characters are very supported at home they can't be supported too much at school otherwise nothing would happen they'd be so well-rounded exactly it's, I think I think it's Philip Pullman who said that it is a truth you universally acknowledge that for a child to go on adventure we must first dispense of the parents so we're just shifting that slightly we have to dispense of something in order for yeah, someone's got to be bad it can't yeah someone has got to be teachers I love you but yeah. Um, no, and, and also you do have uh, you do have a very understanding teacher in show as who you are as well. Like it, it, it's a uh, and there's a, a librarian in Spark, so there's a balance yeah. always. There's, yeah. there's always always a balance, and and I also appreciate that when you're saying a supportive environment at home, you, you have to have um, that balance yeah. that balance somewhere. And I loved how it just felt very true. It's a very, <laughs> very uh, obvious thing to say. It felt very true, the environment at home with a, with a family who recognised that they don't understand, so step back when they need to and and hope that their silence at, is enough, like just yeah. being present uh, and sitting in what may be an uncomfortable situation mm. with their child is enough. And I thought that was yeah. a word I don't like beautiful like I really did I thought that was just lovely I thought it was lovely Thank you. um I wanted to say also I have more questions but for anyone who would like to ask questions um please do put those in the chat type them and um 
we can get round to to answering those um, as well. Um, can I request, a request, please, a TV show of this book? Could you oh. just make that happen, just for me personally? I would really like that. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah, I. That's. I don't know if I would want to watch. I mean, I would watch a TV show of Spark, of course, I would. But I would love to watch a TV show of Show. Yeah. where other people would put because there's so much I couldn't do because it's through Cora's eyes and um, I'm not going to spoil it for anyone but you know it, she can only it's only through her eyes we don't see all, all the all the comings and goings but in a film or a tv show we could you know we could see a lot more and I would I would love that I mean god wouldn't that be great <laughs> I was just thinking about tv shows that I loved as a kid like you know like the queen's nose um, Famous Five, The Borrowers, that kind of epic children's TV that you just get so invested yeah. in. And this would work so well for television. <laughs> please, please, that would be, uh, that would be... I would love it. Um, it's so, so good. Um, okay, so what books have you read recently and loved? I would love to know God, that. you would throw this at me. I would. Um, I have loved, I've got Carrie Burnell's I'm Not a Label, which I liked. So oh, yes. I have got Love and Colour by this is not a kid's book. I always forget these events. I'm technically a kid's author. This is an adult book, but I love it. Um, who else have we got? Um, oh, hang on. So Wranglestone, which oh, is that. What is that? It's like it's a futuristic kind of post-apocalypse book which I normally hate I hate apocalyptic stuff but it's set on like this big frozen lake and there's these zombies descending in and it's an LGBT like love story between these two um young boys as they kind of live in this community that that's on the ice and with these monsters coming in um not COVID you know I'd understand if people didn't want to pick it up just yet but it's actually really wholesome and really lovely and um it's Costa Costa shortlisted which is why I picked it up because I, I missed it in February when it came out last year and it's you know it's just good to see some LGBT in kids books and I I'm just writing it down I'm just writing it down <laughs> Rangle. 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 Okay. it's got this incredible setting and I, I'm a sucker for an incredible setting that makes yeah so I really enjoyed that one by sorry not for the author's name by Darren Charlton published by uh, Stripes so Little Tiger Press kind of mm. um I can't think of anything I, oh every book goes out of my brain That's I'm okay. reading I'm I'm reading um at your age Eve Brown on on iBooks at the moment which is uh, again it's an adult book I'm sorry everyone <laughs> I hope you, but um it's an uh woman of color autistic love story and um uh, Talia Hibbert is an incredible um neurodivergent author of color and I love her books so much amazing amazing I have come across this question a lot and I've seen it asked and I think it can be a little bit reductive but I still find it interesting to explore people say that writing a book always teaches you one specific thing because the writing process for each one is always different so like you learn well okay I'm not going to do that again or <laughs> etc what were key things that you learned in the writing process of both of these books do you think? oh my god Jen you ask really good questions I'm used to the same four questions all the time this is really hard um <laughs> I'm used to explaining what autism is um <laughs> no I was really wrong <laughs> With Spark, I think what I learned was that I could write a book. I'd never written a book before Spark. Um, so it was, you know, I think that's, I learned that getting to the end is the most important thing and not, not, not reading over what you wrote the day before and, and taking. I'm still learning that. I'm still learning that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I learned it. I'm not saying I practice it, but, <laughs> but I learned that. With show, I think I learned, I, it was scary for me to write genre after Spark because, um, in middle grade, um, middle grade is incredible. Um, I have the most unbelievable contemporary writers, but people kind of stay in their in in their thing. If they write fairy tales, they write fairy tales. If they write mysteries, they write mysteries. People don't tend to kind of jump about with, in genre. Um, so I was like, am I doing something really silly here by doing a science fiction uh, th- sort of not a thriller, but you know, is that a silly thing to do after I've had success with with this contemporary kind of not kitchen sink but you know a contemporary kind of slice of life book 
is that a bad decision? And I think what I learned with show is the gut has to go where it wants to go. And and you can't think, you can't put your commercial hat on and be like, is this a good business move? Um, you have to just do what you want to write. And um, so right now, book three, I'm working on a, a fantasy, which is kind of completely, yeah, it's completely different again. And I think what I learned from show was that's okay. Um, as long as there's great characters and and things that make people feel things, they will come with you. So, yeah. I agree. I mean, my agent would disagree. He cries. <laughs> I know. <laughs> not know what I'm writing next. A lot of people in publishing are like, don't fix what isn't broke. Just do what you're good at. <laughs> well, I signed with my agent when I was writing nonfiction, uh, <laughs> writing about bookshops. Uh, and it was it was humor fiction. It was very different. But I it was at the same time. Like, I was try- at the same time I was trying to do my you know serious hat poetry short stories the stuff that was going to make me lots of money you know the the, the <laughs> literary <laughs> um so it's been interesting to do that like work with nonfiction and then uh write poetry and also short stories and now kids books too I think he's given up to so just just do it because I think the the argument sometimes is that um the the writers will say yeah but well Neil Gaiman does it and 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 not everyone can get away doing that but I also think you need to you just need to do it you need to do like you need to write what you think the you know you're talking about the difference between books are those so strong and and very similar and I don't mean that in a these sound the same kind of way but it's that it's that strength that shines through in both of them it doesn't matter that it's can you share the one you're working on now I'm very nosy can I share stuff about it um I it's due in May I can say that because that's in my head um I I can say that it's going to have a neurodivergent heroine, but she's not autistic. It's a she's dyspraxic. I'll say that uh, I am also dyspraxic, so I'm writing a dyspraxic heroine for anyone who has any kids or themselves as dyspraxic. Um, I'm writing about that, so um, there will be another autistic character in the story, but they won't be the lead. Um, we're going to be looking at. Mm, it's, is it magical realism more than fantasy I think it's more ma- it's, it's set in our world with magic so um not in an epic faraway kingdom it's here it's in Edinburgh actually and that's all I can say that's quite a lot so um <laughs> Edinburgh magical realism with indie kids yeah it sounds awesome it sounds awesome so will it come out this time next year Do I think so February 2022 I think is the plan Amazing. but who knows <laughs> with where we are who knows who knows third Who knows? lockdown can't wait but <laughs> and what I mean what writing advice would you give to anyone watching this of any age who wants to write what key things have helped you I would say that, I mean the thing that people say all the time is read and and that is true you do have to read a ton but I also think it's important to watch really good film and television um I try and write accessible books that are quite um, not fast paced, but that don't hang around in one place too much. And I think that comes much more from my love of film and thinking very visually. Um, You may notice my books aren't hugely descriptive. This is partly because I think kids imagine their own things and they don't listen to you. And also because um, I, I don't, that's just the way my brain works. So I, I don't, analyze things in that way and my heroines don't either so if you you know read as much as you can audiobooks are valid graphic novels are valid but film and tv is valid too and I also love to read plays for dialogue I love because when you read a play all you have really is dialogue so I love to teach myself about subtext in that way and I read a lot of plays and think okay if this was on a stage it's so boring on the page but if it was on stage everyone would be laughing or making noise because the actors would be doing things so as a writer you kind of are like a director and you have to direct your characters and give them their line readings and give them their intention and work out what the subtext is so I also think it's important to read plays as well as wonderful books. I think I I think that's true and I also think um, from the point of view of because I do editing work too and I do find like people's dialogue is often where they 
that they fall down a little bit because we forget people don't speak in full sentences oh. interrupt each other all the time um and I think it, uh, reading plays definitely helps with that if you can watch how people truly interact with each other especially yeah. when they're comfortable yeah and I I especially because I write books that are first person so we're in the characters heads and they are Addy is 11 and Cora is 12 I do not like when this is personal again this is totally my taste I don't like when kids books have the kids inner voice being very too colloquial and too like this is how a child talks I'm like in children's heads they are eloquent they are verbose they have incredible they know what they think my characters when they speak to other people aren't always using big words and big you know but when they are in their own heads they are incredibly articulate and so please don't feel you have to do kids speech um, because I've never heard a lot of children speak the way some books <laughs> say that children talk and I've never heard a kid a kid talk like this but you know who knows but um so don't don't feel pressured to to take on a voice your voice is fine yeah and I think it's really interesting to play with that right I think I've seen a lot of I don't know if criticism is the right word but skepticism with uh, the other end of that John Green's books because his characters always speak almost Shakespearean like they, they are very intense and yeah. they say very intelligent things the and they, are intense. yeah exactly so intense and so I mean, I was so emo. I would quote things all the time. I knew you know, everything as a teenager. You couldn't tell me anything. Like, and so I, I, I do agree. I mean, I agree with you. I, of course, people don't really talk like that, but teenagers think they talk like that sometimes. And that's, that's what's so great about them. Is that it, and they are the center of their story. And if they yeah. were going to put it on a page, that would be that's what they would say. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have. We've uh, got some Q and A's, and they've said we're allowed to go over because a few people had trouble joining. I can't see yeah. the questions in the chat. Am I looking at the wrong? Um, it's on Q and A function, which I have. Um, so I'm happy. To I'm happy to read them if you want. Um, so there's yeah, I have it. Exactly. Okay. I can't see that. Yes, please. No worries. I'll just I'll just have a quick scroll. Um, Da, 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 da. did you have a Mr Allison at any point while you were at school yes and he was called Mr Allison so <laughs> it, it was not a lot of imagination there um oh good some of them are just comments that's really great um thank you so much lovely 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 um uh would you ever write a YA adult book absolutely I have a YA that I'm desperate to write I don't know if anyone would want it it feels like I'm the only one that believes in it at the moment oh yay but yeah I'd love to write a YA. Uh, really would love to um are there any deleted scenes from show I think that's from lovely lovely ocean who's such a such a great um support um there are a lot of deleted scenes from show mostly things that could never be in the book because it's from Cora's point of view and excuse me I always write stuff that will never make it into the manuscript because I think readers can sort of feel when you've done your homework and readers only get maybe 20% of what that work is but they can feel the other 80% if that makes sense um so I do a ton of backstory and a ton of other work that I that I intend never to have in the manuscript and with show and with uh, the pomegranate institute you know I wrote a lot about what's it like being in a job interview with Dr. Gold? What is it like to be sat across from her if you're applying to be one of her technicians? What does she and Magnus Hawkins, Adrian's father, talk about alone? Like all these things I write so that I know what's going on. Even though Cora will never see it and will never know any of it, I do. And then I can put it into the actual manuscript because I know that, oh, they've just come from a meeting where they talked about this. So the atmosphere might be a bit frosty um, or does that make sense so it's it's, it's like you see we're in b footage that yes like, exactly yeah. exactly yeah so there's lots of stuff that won't make it in and that's deliberate it was the same with spark so i wrote about all the witches who obviously were not um in the actual narrative they were referenced um and i wrote lots of stuff with kitty and nina together just because they have to have so much friction yeah they have to have so much friction when they're together that i need to know what's just happened like what have they just argued about and and there's a scene in spark which hopefully people know where Nina says something horrible and gets sent away from the table and she and Kitty are just like snapping at each other so, because they just had a massive fight um, which no one else knows about so that's 
I mean, I also recommend people do it. It's just really helpful to go, this scene doesn't do anything for the plot and it doesn't and it doesn't belong in the narrative because the main character doesn't see it, but it will really help me work out how the ensemble cast react to each other. Yeah, no, that completely makes sense. Also, I found the Q&A section. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, okay, Jenny says, my question is, is there something linked to show which you have been longing to be uh, asked about or have the opportunity to talk about which hasn't come up so far? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Jen's asked the most incredible questions that I can actually finally probably say no because what I really want to talk about with show is... Um, the relationship between Cora and Adrian and their relationship with their own neurodivergency. Um, people want me to talk about being a neurodivergent writer a lot. Sometimes they want to talk about it more than the work, but actually the work is what I, I am passionate about. That's where I put all of my, not my opinions, but that's where I put a lot of the passion in. So if you read the work and you really understand it, that's the most incredible thing to me, um, rather than just making me go, yes, there's not a lot of indie kids in publishing this is why I write these books um so yeah well it's hard to say without spoilers I'm trying to think of a way to go around it I just really love when people point to show or spark and say I get this I know what this is um and that's happened a lot with show already which I'm so thrilled about because I was so scared about this book um being book two and being so different from spark in a lot of ways um and I can't spoil the scene for people, but Jen's referenced it already. There's a scene at the very end of the book where it's on TV. And mm. that scene was not in the synopsis. It was not in the plan. It came very spontaneously. And and it, it, it says all I want to say in interviews. If you just read that scene, then I think you'll know how I feel about a lot of things. Um, so I hope people will. Did that makes I just... it does, and it, that's what's so frustrating. And I find that in interviews personally too, where if someone says, "What's your opinion on a topic?" or "Can you talk about being, you know, disabled or neurodivergent?" What is that like for you? And it's like, well, but the writing is me telling you. Yeah, what it's that's like. it. So if that's not enough for you, then <laughs> yeah, and they're not autobiographies. They're not, you know, I've not done any of these things. But the lens is very true. I talk a lot about the lens when people say, are you like Adi or Cora? Which one are you? And I always say, I'm neither. The lens is mine. The way that they see the world, um, the way that they're, they have sensory, that's, that's the bit of me that I put in. Um, and they aren't on a soapbox. They aren't, you know, they're, they're not saying what I think. They're saying what I would say if I was in their imagined circumstances. Mm -hmm. And... And that's what I wish people would, and when I say people, I don't mean readers. I don't mean all the incredible people watching this or who support me. I mean, people that want to, you know, are just like, why do you write about kids like this? You know, why is it important that these kids are in books? Why are you asking me that? Like, why, why, why is it not important? Why is it taking so long? Why am I getting letters from people saying that this is the first time I've ever read a book because it's the only time I've ever felt like, I can. Why am I getting adults sending me pictures of the book with tabs, millions of tabs, saying I've never heard anyone else say this before, but this is how I feel. Like that's why it's important. And I and I th this has turned into what question do I not want to be asked anymore? <laughs> but it's turned into stop asking me why it's important for people like me to be in books. It's it's really insulting. And it's and um and I really hope no one's put that in the chat box or it's gonna be very awkward. Oh, but my no <laughs> no but, but like I get why people do it you know they they want they're giving me a platform to talk about why it's important but it just is these kids are growing up with a lot of messaging and a lot of um yeah I'd say a lot of signals and messages that say you aren't made right something went wrong with you and we'll tolerate you don't worry like we'll put up with you but you're not made right and you should probably be quiet about it and I'm so sick of seeing books like that I'm so sick of this incredible industry that I love to work in promoting these books and promoting the idea that we have to overcome things and if, if anything 
if I was to talk about show and what I would love to talk about more with show, it's the idea of perfection and how most people's idea of perfection is an absolute crop of nonsense. And everybody needs to examine um, that a lot more, I would say. I think so. I would agree. <laughs> I, also, I mean, it, not that it's a question that we need to answer that why is it important, but we only need to look so far as the Twitter conversation we were having last night when people were flagging the book that's on, was it the Irish? It's the Irish is on the curriculum. So children yeah. are being given this book. For people that don't know, it's a book where um, a tw- it's a character in, in a book that's on the Irish curriculum and the character has a brother that's autistic. And they say, I wish you could take a pill that would make him, you know, not be autistic or, or not have autism. And then, you know, he wouldn't give us so much trouble. He wouldn't, he would understand what he does to us. And I just want to, you know, I don't believe in cancel culture. I don't believe in in getting into fights about things, but I just want to put my fist through the screen because I think you're, you don't see what's wrong with this because you don't realize that people are in the room and that they are your customer and they are your audience. You don't appreciate that. And this is, this kills you to read things like this. It's humiliating it's degrading it gives you the worst self-esteem I didn't say the word autistic till I was 25 Mm. I wasn't gonna let anybody know because of that messaging it's absolutely enrages me to the point that that's why I think a lot of people in the industry find me quite um off-putting and don't want anything to do with me because they're like she's always angry but I'm like that it does make me angry because they are young people and they're they're still learning about who they are and and they don't have the articulation that Cora and Addy have because I gave them that, that kind of hindsight that I have so that the kids reading it could be like that. But most kids don't have- people. Yeah, yeah, you're giving it to other people. And if I can just rant for a moment longer and then we'll move on because it's not, you know, fun to watch. But when, when you're a disabled kid, statistically, you might be the only one in your family you certainly might be the only one in your class. You may even be the only one in your school. Depends. And that is enormous. You do not see yourself on television. You do not see yourself in books until now. Um, We're in a golden age now where people like Jen and people like Kerry and, you know, we're getting much, much better content. But growing up, I did not. Um, it's, It's so, and that's every day. And you just learn, you're like, I am not, the protagonist of this story. I'm not the protagonist of my own story. I am an extra in my own life. And that is awful. So stop asking me why these kids deserve books about them and start asking why people are so resistant to that and resistant to people like me actually being able to tell them our own voices authors. And, um, you know, I, 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 there's there's newspapers that won't read me because they don't like what I talk about. That's that's fine, but I'm not going to shut up. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's yeah. God, I don't even know what I was saying. You will, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. If you, if you ever shut up, I would be very cross about it, <laughs> and I just have to tell you to start talking again. Um, but it is it's that the. Oh, that battle with the the anger, because then it, it's used as a weapon against you. And you try so hard not to be angry for so long, and yeah. you try and be the um, the peacemaker, the mediator, oh, the educator. Oh, the- this is get into therapy, Alan. I'm here for it. I'm <laughs> I'm here for it. The, well, I know you're trying. I know you're really trying. Um, but. <sighs> If the only time kids see disabled kids is on children in need once a year, we're setting them up to fail. And we'll, or as the villains in yes, films. with you know as as the James Bond villain who has a, a burn, or um, or that horrendous book that you talked about that I won't name, but it's just like people absorb these messages, and when people disagree with me and go, oh well, they're just books, I'm like, I live it. I've lived with people, you know, telling me how much they loved Curious Incident for 20 years and I don't want to hear it anymore. Um, so, yes. Um, <laughs> thank it's, you. I think, <laughs> I think the, it's very easy to dismiss anger when you don't see all the little things as well as the big things every single day. I mean, when I was little, I was told, 
by a family member that in my life, I was going to have to be nicer to people because otherwise they wouldn't like me. You're going to have to be better than other people. You're going to have to smile all the time and you're going to have to show people in other ways that you're a nice person because otherwise they're they're not going to like you. And that messaging isn't just them saying that, but as you say, it's in, it's in books, um, either by its absence or by the opposite of that. And when people say that they're just books or they're just films, this is just a book. book. (laughs) Then it's just a book and it's the right kind of powerful Oh yeah, that power is immense, and I, I think that people uh, so underestimate the power when it's the other way too. Yeah, uh, and we really need to hold both of those things simultaneously and, and talk about them. Um, and, and there's a line in show where Adrian says, "Once you work out exactly who something like this, I'm paraphrasing my own work, but he says, once you work out exactly who you are and you like it and you accept it and you love it, you become dangerous." Mm-hmm. And I've definitely found that to be true. When I was a, when I was a self-hating disabled person, people liked me a lot more. They loved me when I apologized more, when I, you know, would bend over backward, you know, everything. They, it was so much easier when I, for a lot, in a lot of ways, when I was masking for people. You, but you learn who really accepts you when you say, don't talk like that to me, or you're wrong or you're not that's not helpful whatever it is um and this goes for any kind of marginalization it's it makes people uncomfortable but you learn to be okay with that but for kids I don't want them to go through those 10 years of of pacifying other people and bowing and scraping and all the things that I did I want them to have the tools now to go this is who I am if you don't accept it then I'm going to associate you with the villains in this book and I'll have nothing more to do with you. That's the dream. Um, yes. That seems like a really good note to kind of draw to a close on, I think. Like the, yeah. And I, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, I was walking and I was thinking that when we do things like that and put ourselves out there or we're thinking about like traumatic experiences, it feels like wild swimming. It feels the first time you do it, it's so cold and so horrible and you want to run away from it and you feel so vulnerable and you want to get warm and go back to that safe space, the safe space that isn't actually very safe, but yeah, you're exactly. It's like masking, as you said. Um, But the more you do it, the more numb you become to that and and the more liberating it eventually becomes and you're paving the way for so many um not just kids adults too and to cut down on that self-hatred and that waiting time and that internalized ableism and it's so powerful and I just want to thank you for it so much because it's thank you there's one last thing I want to say just because someone said in the chat um someone said how how did you come to disclosing your diagnosis and I just want to say I got a question the other day from someone that said it was a a podcast and they asked me, um, do you think um, it's possible to rely on diversity in your books a little too much? And I I looked at the question and and thought about it and I thought the only reason I disclose my diagnosis proudly, I'm not ashamed. The reason I talk about it is because kids are listening. I'm not talking about it for you industry people who are trying to work out the best way to make copy. I talk about it for these kids and they run from the back of their classrooms to the laptop to talk to me when I do virtual school visits. And they say, you're the first autistic adult I've ever seen. And that's, I didn't see any adults. Like I didn't see anyone like me when I was young. I thought I was the only one. So I do talk about my diagnosis a lot. I know it makes some people uncomfortable, but I'm, it's, it's not a marketing gimmick. It is so that kids and adults, my lovely autistic adults who are also my readers, can see it. And so hopefully they can be empowered and the silence and the shame can stop being normalized. Um, I just want to say that because I think a lot of people sometimes think this is a bit of a gimmick. It's not. I'm so aware that people are listening. And that's why I talk about it as much as I do. And that's what I wanted to just end (laughs) with. Some other people might use it as a gimmick people who don't have lived experiences of those things and think oh that could be good for marketing but I think for us it's about as you say in the book you're talking to the people in the room yeah you're talking to your room this is 
all our room. Yeah. I'm going to cry now. I'm going to go cry in a corner. <laughs> this has been so lovely, Elle. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who came. Thank you. Um, this has been this has been the best. Thank, thank you, Blackwells. Thank you, Jen. This has been such an honour to finally meet you sort of face to face. You're like a beautiful gram. <laughs> Thank you so much both of you for such a lovely event and thank you particularly for staying on a little bit after six um, to make up for the people who um, had difficulty getting in at the start. If you were one of those people, I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, we don't really know what happened. We think it may be something to do with Zoom because we kind of sent the sent the links out multiple times and you didn't seem to be receiving them so we're not sure where the um issue was happening unfortunately but the event is being recorded so what we'll do is um we'll make that available to you very shortly um either at some kind of viewing party or by sending it in to you um individually um we will make sure there's a way for you all to see that in its entirety at some point uh very soon um so i'll update you all uh once i have more information on how we're going to make that happen um, so uh, if you ordered a book with your ticket, they will be dispatched over the next couple of days and should be with you shortly. Um, if you haven't ordered a book with your ticket, um, you can go to blackwalls.co.uk and order one. And I would advise doing so um, so that you don't miss out uh, because Shows Who You Are is a wonderful book. And uh, I hope, I assume most of you, well, I assume some of you have already read it, but if not, you're in for a real treat. Um, if you enjoyed the event this evening um, as much as I did, then please do take a look at the, the rest of our events programme that we've got coming up, uh, particularly for children. We've got an event which isn't online yet, but will be very shortly coming up with Michelle Paver in a few weeks for her most recent uh, Wolf Brother book. And I think that is everything from me. So um, all that remains for me to say is thank you so much, Elle McNichol, and congratulations on Show Us Who You Are and A Kind of Spark. Um, you know, Blackwells are a huge, huge fans of yours, as I, as I said at the start. So it's been a real treat to have you here this evening discussing both books. Thank you, Jen Campbell, so much for chairing um, and uh, hosting such a lovely discussion. Uh, thank you all so much for attending. And I hope to see you at another Blackwells event very soon. Thanks and good night, everybody. Bye.